Let's bring the volume down. You tell me if that's too loud or too quiet. Okay, welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. It looks like everything is running okay, I think. <laughs> um, today, we are going to look at another one of my very, very, very favorite artists. This artist, uh, Lin Feng Mian, is probably the i think the most ultimately the most inspiring artist that i can think of considering the you're not going to believe his life story it, it is it, it's such an unbelievable life story that it's a wonder that a film hasn't been made and maybe there is a chinese language film that's that's exists out of there but i i don't think so for a number of reasons we're going to get into um his reputation has he's been sort of re-embraced by chinese uh society but for many years he was um uh rejected he, he was he's sort of a guy who existed in between many different worlds as we'll see I, it's just unbelievable let's let's get into let's get into this um uh, I'm so excited to, to make a painting about this artist because um, I just I'm so inspired by by everything that he's he went through th throughout the course of his life. Anyway, so this is one of the paintings we're going to make today. I think I might just make this one, um, but there's a there's a few others that you could also make. Oh, that's interesting. And then this here. So there's there's three paintings in a Dropbox folder, and along with each of these paintings, you'll see some outlines for these. Oh, and that one's right. Okay. So there's some outlines that you're welcome to use to transfer that image onto a canvas. I'm going to show you exactly how to do that in just a second. So why don't we just take a quick look at a few links that we have here uh, the first thing I want to show you is the private Facebook page just for people like you who are watching me right now who may want to paint along with me. And then if you do do that, I would love for you to upload your drawing to this group so that uh, people can see your work to give you good, good support and kudos. This is an incredibly supportive community. It's such a really cool thing. Uh, I get notifications and I look and, and just see like the love that each one of the, of the artists in this group are sharing it makes me so excited to have found such a wonderful group of people. Um, and you can see here's, uh, here's Vanya's version of the turtle we did a few months ago. So some people are painting with me live on uh, as I'm filming it. And some people are painting these paintings that I, I did months ago, right? And they're up there for you to paint as, as long as you like. Here's Molly's version of the, of the Wu Guangzhong painting we did on Thursday last week. Uh, Gemini's version. And people are doing their own versions of other artists that we haven't done. Um, so here's Gemini's version of a Franklin Carmichael group of seven paint. Or, and did it as a pastel, which I think is super cool. And then people posing questions to other people in the group here. Uh, here's Paula's version of, I'm not even, I think this is just out of her own imagination, a, uh, but I love the colors in here, Paula. Anyway, so this is, a, I strongly suggest you join the group. The next thing, remember I told you there was those outlines and where to, uh, that I'm going to show you where they are. Well, there's a link to a Dropbox folder. You go in the Dropbox folder and you see all these names, some of which you're going to recognize and probably most of them you won't. Um, although I strongly think everyone who um, wants to be an artist should be should recognize most of these names because most of these names are artists who are 
uh, all each one of them are fabulous masters, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest artists of all time. Uh, you know, there's Leonardo da Vinci, obviously, and Salvador Dali, probably the most famous ones, but uh, there's some big heavy hitters there. People around the world will recognize some of these names. Anyway, here's where we are today. And you're gonna, if you click on that folder, you'll see, what, nine files there. Essentially, you have, um, you have your, these three files, and then two versions of each outline. One is a JPEG and one is a PDF. So that's, that's why we have nine uh, files in there. Okay, so you can just take this and you can print it out on your photocopier or, or printer, <laughs> or, or you can take it to a photocopier and get it printed. Some photocopiers, you can put a USB stick in and you can print them out onto regular photocopy paper. I think that's what I meant to say. And then we're gonna transfer these onto Canvas. Sometimes I do this well ahead of time Today is not one of those times. It's been a bit of a, a very busy uh, past week for me. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do this. So you can get some carbon paper, graphite paper. There's, again, a link in the description below. And you can use this stuff many times. Like this one's probably... This might be at its... Well, let's, let's, let's give it one more shot today. We'll use that carbon paper here. So the first thing I want to do is just center the image. Generally, that's what we want to do is center the image. I am going to maybe drop it down a little bit closer to the bottom. And I'll explain why here in a moment. Um, many of his paintings were actually square format. So we'll take a look at some of his art once we kind of get get going here um, so I have added some extra space to the tops and to the bottom just so it will fit on a 9 by 12 size canvas and if you want to get this exact same canvas that I'm using today again there's a link in the description below um, I'm sort of I cycle between three different brands that I think work really really well and they're they are better than the ones you get at the dollar store so let's, I'm going to put this carbon paper underneath here. I'm going to grab my pencil. And um, just making sure I'm doing the right one. <laughs> okay. And then I'm going to, I usually use a colored pencil because it's a little bit easier for me to see what lines I've drawn and which ones I haven't yet. And I'm not going to do every single line on here. This is really just to help me get the general composition, where things are on the page. Uh, I've, of course, I've done a whole drawing course, and you're welcome to watch that. That's free here, also on YouTube. Many people who are taking the class right now swear by it, say it was really helpful, and people ask me, should I do the drawing course first or do this one first? You know, it's hard to say. Um, I... I've heard many people say that doing them at the same time is helpful. So it might mean rather than painting with me twice a week, you know, since I'm doing paintings twice a week, is to maybe do once one painting a week. Choose your favorite one that, that's coming up. And then do a lesson or two of the drawing. The drawing classes are a little bit shorter than some of my painting classes. Um... So, let me see. Like, you can see I sort of skip every second line or so, every third line. The, the reason why I, the drawings are sometimes much more complicated is just so that, you know, I thought to myself, well, you know, if I'm going to go to all this trouble of, of doing the tracing... I might as well do a, a pretty good job on them so that if someone wanted to actually paint on top of it, like a, like maybe yourself, or you want to give it to a kid afterwards to finish for you, let's just make sure that this is working. Yeah, look at that. Okay, it's transferring well. I was getting, I was just a little bit worried that this is an older piece of, or not an older piece of carbon paper, but one that I've used many times. 
Just wanted to make sure that I wouldn't do all of this and then find out that there was nothing on the other side, right? And trust me, I've done the whole thing like this and realized I didn't even put the carbon paper underneath there. I totally spaced out on that, so. Um, as I've said many a time, like... I'm a good person to watch for clues as to what not to do, but how to goof up big time. And, you know, it gives probably could give you some sense of satisfaction to, uh, to watch a professional artist fumble around sometimes. <laughs> it's, maybe it's like figure skating. Like that's, I, I personally, like my, my, my mom and sister love watching figure skating. And through them, I've gone to some like, you know, world championship kind of stuff. And I personally find it causes me so much anxiety because the only thing I think about is like, oh, that somebody's going to fall down here and it's just going to be heartbreaking. <laughs> Maybe they're going to get hurt or they're going to be so upset because they've trained for months and months and then they fall on the on the, the biggest day of their lives. Whew. So, anyway, maybe that's how some people <laughs> watch this. You're like, oh, I wonder, wonder where he's going to goof up today. Okay, so I've got my tracing down there. We can pull the carbon paper away. And hey, you know what? I might be able to get away with another couple of paintings on there. And then afterwards... Um, again, I, I've been saving all of these, and I think maybe one day our daughter can use them. You can also see that it transfers onto the other side. Um, that's because this carbon paper is double-sided. I don't really know what the value of that would be, and, uh, but hey, they made it that way. Um, so I'll set these other ones aside, and we'll see later on how, how things are going with this particular painting and how far we can get so uh, let's start putting some uh, paint on the canvas and to do that I'm just gonna get the paints out of my paint box this is just your plain old shoe box and every single thing that I need to make a painting can fit inside the shoe box so get all of my materials out basically I, I'm <laughs> right now I'm, I'm illustrating a comic book a big graphic novel that's gonna take me all the way until the end of the year and so I don't really have too much time before class to set up and I also think it is helpful for people just to see how this process works there is other YouTube videos out there where you just turn it on immediately people are start painting and I think that's great, but it also still kind of mystify, keeps some of the mystery of how paintings are made. And a big part of my goal as an artist and a teacher is to break down that mystery and, and make things um, as transparent as possible for people. Because one of the big things with art, um, as we've, we've probably talked about a few times, is that many artists are very, very secretive about how they make their art um, and what tools they use, what colors they use, etc. And it ends up forcing the rest of us to sort of reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. And I think that slows the, the growth of art, right? And it certainly uh, makes it more difficult for other people to learn, right? So anyway, that would be my part of my contribution as an artist to the world, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Let's, um, let's put some colors down. Now, um, it's always interesting to me, to, especially as we explore artists' other artists from around the world as to think about how we can use 
some of the techniques we've already learned towards a painting like this. Now, um, Lin was... He, he is really, really important. Probably, uh, at the end of the day, arguably, the single most important Chinese artist um, in terms of modern art. Obviously, there's, there's lots of incredible artists that preceded him, but they were painting in a far more traditional way. Lin um, was really the very first uh, artist, he was amongst the very, very first artists to, to leave China and to go study in Paris in, uh, I think, 1919, 19, I think he left and started school in 1920. Um, and he was one of the very first students to, to, to learn Western approaches to art. And then, um, and then brought that back to China. I and mean, there's a whole interesting story. Again, there, there is a video that I put in the video description below, a great documentary, highly recommend it. Um, cause it's going to cover some of the things I'm going to talk about. Obviously I won't get to all of it, but, uh, Anyway, so he is really interesting because he bridges a, a big gap that existed and fused many techniques from both traditions, both uh, cultures. And um, so I th what I, if I was to think about, like, often what we've done is put a, a primer, a, an underpainting underneath, and then painted over it. And... I would suspect that he would have done the same thing, because this is definitely a Western approach to painting. And if I just kind of scan through here, when I'm up close on this painting, it's tricky to say. Now, this is painted on paper, and it's not with acrylic. I'm sure that he was probably using more traditional inks, although that white, I wonder what that white is. That white could be oil paint. So, hmm, how should we approach this? I'm gonna, you know what, I'm still gonna approach this in a, in the more, in a Western way. And I'm gonna put down a, a yellow ground so I'm going to put this some warm yellow onto my canvas or, or onto my palette here. I'm going to put a little bit more in that. Okay. And then take some water. This is really the only water I, I usually use at any point in the painting process besides cleaning my brushes. Just going to scrub in here. So I'm just mixing that water into the paint as thoroughly as possible. That water's going to thin it out a little bit and, and help it get into the weave of the canvas. Okay. One of the things I just realized I forgot to do is to sand the canvas again. Um, so usually what I do is I take these canvas boards out of the packaging and then I give it a quick sand and then I apply some acrylic gesso to it, white acrylic gesso, which I did earlier this afternoon. On the floor all around me, which you can't see, are, are canvases laying on top of newsprint drying on the floor of my studio. Because I usually, when, I'm, when I do it, I'm like, you know what, let's just do a whole bunch of these. So I did 28 of them this afternoon. I also get... I like getting the edges here. I love, what I think is so cool is, especially as this, this painting is going to transform, and we're not, obviously not going to see any of the yellow really on the surface of this painting by the end, but we might see a little bit of it on the edges of the painting. And I always just think that just makes a painting, 
um, have an extra little element that that causes people when they see it, especially if you're just sort of leaning up on your fireplace or whatever, to go like, oh, I see there's a little bit of yellow on the edges. Why did you paint the, the, the edges yellow? And, the, and then you can go, oh, well, actually, I painted the whole thing yellow to start, and then I painted over it with other colors, and that ends up giving the painting a lot more brightness, and you get a whole conversation about painting with them. Okay, so um, I'm gonna let's let me just uh, take a second here to while this is drawing, I'm gonna use the blow dryer here in a second. Um, I see. Look at all oh, great comments here. There's um. Molly here. Hello, sounds fine. Okay, the volume sounds good. Sue says, looks and sounds good. Deborah's, hi Molly. Hi everyone, sound is great. Charmay's here. Hi Charmay. Uh, Sue says, I'm enjoying these Asian portraits. Uh, Kathy says, I can't believe I finally made one of your live shows. <laughs> well, good to see you, Kathy. Thanks for making time in your afternoon to join me. Okay, so let's... Um, what I want to show here is just a little bit about his, maybe I'll just leave that up here, his biography. Um, man, I, like, I, I, again, I'm going to show you, there's, there's a link to this, oh, let's, sorry. There is a, a, a link to this, it's like 50 minute long documentary, great documentary. There's some stuff in there that I'll cover, some stuff that's not on documentary that I'll cover. Um, that I've read elsewhere in, in my research. Um, but if we just kind of jump back here. So he was born in 1900. He talks about it being unfortunate that he was born during that time because if, you're, if you know anything about Chinese history, um, I think it was in 1900 where um, basically all of the major world powers at the time invaded China, right? And um, uh, so it was kind of a... a a dark time in the history of China, and he was born into a, a, a poor family, and his wife, or his, not his wife, his mom was a poor peasant woman from, like, the mountains, as they would have said back then, and, um, and was brutally abused by his father, and many historians see that the portraits that he did, including the painting we're about to do today, are um, basically him painting his mother over and over and over again. I mean, I'll get back to why I'm showing you. I've paused it on here in a second. I mean, he, his, his father was a, a, a very mean, horrible person. His father literally took he, him when he was a baby out to the forest to to basically to throw him into the forest and let the wolves eat him when he was a little baby. His mother went out and rescued him, much to his father's chagrin. Um, and then years later, uh, I think when he was seven, his father tried to abandon his wife, or he was going to kill his wife. And um, Lean stopped that murder from happening got a knife and like ran out into the street to defend his mother from being murdered by his father. And then his father was like, okay, I won't kill your mom, but I'm kicking her out of the house and I'm selling her. He's so his dad sold his mom. He never saw his mom again. He spent the rest of his life trying to find his mom to no avail. Like, I mean, all just as I'm saying, like, it, I, I, I was like, oh man, I hope I don't like burst into tears thinking about today's episode. Like, we're just getting started with the level of, with the tragedies that befell this poor man throughout his life. So his mother was taken away. And then again, like out of a movie, like you cannot write this stuff. There, there was this lottery in, in the town that he lived in. Uh, where they sold these tickets, so I think of it as sort of like a 50-50 draw. You know, if you you know here in the, in the Western world, you have these things that like uh, at hockey games and stuff where they sell 
tickets and you buy a ticket and the winner gets 50% of the earnings and then the other 50% goes to a charity or something. Anyway, there was this lottery. And as like a young boy, he, he took all of his savings, he bought a lottery ticket. Lo and behold, he won the lottery and he won this huge amount of money, enough money to like, uh, like the, I, I can't remember the size, this, but enough to buy a house and have twice as much left over, right? So, of course, his father took all the money, went and got himself a new wife, bought a house, had a bunch of more children with this other woman. Um, but it did enable him to go to school and to study. And while he was there studying, uh, he learned a little bit about painting, enough to like get a, like a, a real yearning to want to make art. Uh, these Most of the paintings that we see are paintings from the 50s and 70s. Most of the art, as we'll get into, the, was destroyed. Pretty much everything he made before the 50s, there's, there's maybe a couple dozen paintings that still exist, but most of it was destroyed. Um, so we're, you can see that they're like, oh, a lot of these paintings look the same. Well, because a lot of these paintings were made towards the end of his life, uh, as we'll get into here. Um, I just think there's are such gorgeous paintings. And you just think, man, what could have happened had um, uh, he... Gosh, all these stupid things... Um, what would have happened had he had been born at a different time, right? The, 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 unfortunately, you know, we are the benefits, the beneficiaries of this poor man's tragic life. I'm not going through all of this here. Let's get into the painting. I'm going to blow dry that. Um, so he wins this lottery and then like there's still money left over by the time he turns 19 or 18 or 19 when he finished what is essentially high school he he went on he, he took a, a boat from Shanghai all the way to Paris uh, and was one of the first young Chinese people to go to Europe to study study art at least right The only other artist I can think of that had as much of a tragic story as him is Rembrandt, the Dutch painter, um, who we'll talk about in a couple of months, um, uh, who similarly had a number of tragedies, his wife and children dying, outlived everyone, uh, and died relatively poor, um, which, spoiler alert, is, is what happened to our artist today. Okay, so this looks dry enough for our underpainting. So let's uh, let's see, what shall we do next? Generally, what I like to do is work my way from the background to the foreground. And so the background in this image is um, uh, this kind of veil, I guess, or maybe it's a window with a curtain, excuse me, uh, behind, and then I, these could be other darker curtains or the wall, I'm not sure exactly. Um, but to do that, what I'm going to do is let's put down, we're going to mix some colors, so, uh, and I'll probably, am, you know, I have some black, but we're probably going to use very little black until um, towards the end here. So uh, I'm going to do what I've done 
in many episodes, which is to basically to mix a really dark color with uh, the paints that that we have. Because I always think it's um, not only is it a great exercise to learn that you can basically make black with just the colors that we're going to put on the palette. Um, but it also makes the paint more vibrant when we've used color that, to, like actual color to make our darker colors rather than just going right to, um, to black. So look at that. I'm still, still these original tubes of paint that I opened back in September. Um, so what we're now like eight months of painting twice a week, making at least two paintings a week. Sometimes I'm making like four or five, and we still have enough paint to do probably another another month's worth of painting. Okay, um, and let's, we'll probably need a little bit of white here as well, right? Okay, so to make a dark color, um, like that we have in the background, we want to make a cooler color, right? We want to make a color that will go into, like, will recede. So um, we want, basically, you can kind, you can make a warm and a cool of any color. When we start getting darker, the colors. Um, it gets kind of harder to tell what is warm and what is cool. Uh, but we can kind of make it lean a little bit towards one color or, or one temperature uh, than another. So how about let's start out with some yellow. And we're probably going to do this right down here. So let's put some yellow down here. And let's take some blue. Okay. And then, so I had cool yellow and cool blue, right? I'm not even going to bother mixing these just yet. And I'm going to take some cool red. I'm going to put these together. So what we're going to get from here is a, is a pretty dark, kind of brownish-gray color. And that's because we've got these two side-by-side -side make a, a really bright, nice... Um, almost fluorescent green, but when we add the red on the other side of the color wheel, not quite completely, well, I guess um, it's not quite exactly perpendicular, but it is pretty close. So by doing that, the color crosses quite close to the neutral core, as we call it. And then we get this here, All right? So if we wanted to make it even darker, we could put a little bit of the warm blue in there, and it's going to go even dark. But I think this is probably pretty good right now. And I'm just sort of mixing it in a little bit more to, to ensure that it's kind of relatively consistent throughout. Okay, so let's... Um, okay, and you know what? I'm going to dilute this a little bit. I'm just going to use a little bit of glazing fluid because one of the, like, the the art, the artists we're talking about used predominantly, like, inks on paper, or at least those are the works that survived. And honestly, one of the reasons why he was using material is because towards the end of his life, he lived in mostly in poverty by himself. Um, and he couldn't afford much. Um, so he used what was kind of available to him. Even though, uh, as we'll see, he, he uh, at different times of his life, was sort of seen as, as a really important person. He just, uh, what a tragedy. In fact, he was the teacher of Wu Guangzhong um, that we're going to talk about, or that we talked about last week, and the artists that we're going to talk about on Thursday, Lee Kern. Okay, so I'm going to take this color and just paint it into the background. You can see that it's a little bit transparent, so we have some of this yellow coming through. 
which I, I like. We might do a second layer of this paint here in a second. Oh, I just went over some of that where that blue is going to go. Okay, oops, let's I'll show you what I just am doing here. You can see I'm painting with a kind of a big brush, which is, tends to be when I'm doing this kind of thing. It's kind of a good idea to use as as big a brush as possible. I've heard many people talk about always use a brush that's just a little bit too big. Because it's especially earlier on in the painting process, it forces you to not worry so much about the details. Um, let's put this... up here. I think I'm just going to paint over there's some um, this kind of flower motif in the curtain. I'm going to paint over that to get started. Okay. Again, I don't mind if it's a little bit streaky. Okay. So, I'm just thinking to myself, do I want to make that darker? I probably do. Do I want, but I can also modify it as I go and think about I could make it more blue or red or anything as I put another layer on. I think what I'll do is. I'm going to, I'll leave this paint here for a second. I'm going to mix up, um, in fact, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm just going to take this same paint. Maybe I'm just going to wipe my paintbrush off. I'm going to use this same color just for the, the, the white in the background. So I just wiped my paintbrush off. I'm not going to clean it, right? I'm just, because I want to have a fairly diluted, color for the background here. So there's a bunch of white. Again, I'm going to put some glazing fluid in here. You could probably use just um, your acrylic medium, clear acrylic medium, which is basically acrylic paint without any color in it. You could do that as well. Uh, for this type of thing. You could also use slow dry medium, although you want you don't want to put too much in because I've learned the hard way. You put if I put a lot of slow dry medium into the paint, well, surprise surprise, it takes a long time to dry. So I've had a few times where um, something literally I've got the hair dryer blowing on it for like ten minutes and it's just still tacky and wet and you just have to let it dry overnight. Okay. So I've mixed this up here and we'll see what happens when we paint with it. Okay. Let's see this here. You know, one of the things that would probably be a good idea is for me just to kind of have an awareness as to where the edge of the curtain is so that I don't have this line coming up and then this one being like, woo, or, or way over here. So I can kind of just make a little alteration at this stage. And don't worry if you if it's a little bit darker up top there. You know, we'll probably do another layer of this color before we're all done anyway. And you can see that 
I'm just going over some of the the the, the lines and stuff that I've painted in the past, or you know, or my my pencil lines. Sorry. Um, okay. And you know what? I'm gonna do the the vase, and maybe even put a, a bit of this color where these flowers are gonna go as well. Um, if if because I'm sure there's probably a few of you who are gonna try to do this with um, maybe ink or watercolor on paper, which would be obviously using, would be closer to the materials that Lean actually used for his, um, for the original painting. Um, so if you were to do that, you, you, you probably wouldn't need to put any color down like the yellow I did. And so you could skip a little bit of steps. Um, and but you would probably still like I always think it's best to have like two layers of color are, are are really really nice like you don't really I don't think you ever want to just mix one color and paint it for a face or for for any it's always what's so much interesting is building a little bit of layers of color and I know that there's definitely a whole school of people out there that would disagree with me vehemently and say that it's just wasting time. But, you know, <laughs> again, we're, we're, we're looking at like the, the masters of art and there's very few of them who painted in that particular way. Um, even the lean here is, you know, there's, um, if I, let's, if we look at this, even though he's painting, ink on paper there's still multiple layers of color that are over um throughout this painting right there because there is some he probably painted some imagery in and then painted over it a little bit darker and maybe painted it out remember he doesn't know what the painting is going to look like before he started he doesn't have the benefit that we have of having the outline and being like oh okay so Oh, okay, so this is going to be a darker color here. He's making it up on the spot, so he doesn't know what it's what needs to be there until he's further on in the painting, right? So we have the benefit of the doubt of, of seeing the master's artwork, and then he's like, oh, okay, this is basically, here. it's like a roadmap, and we just have to follow the roadmap. A few times, little parts of the roadmap are missing, and we got to kind of use what we, we know of painting to, to figure out a way to get there, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's see these two side by side again and think about what our next step is going to be. Hmm. I am thinking. Oh, um, oh I just saw in the comments there. <laughs> The Dever says, I went out paddle boarding yesterday. I fell flat on my face. I laughed so hard. I broke a finger. I will say that I will not be taking stand up paddle boarding sitting down. I'll be back to painting. Um, and then I see, well, first of all, Deborah, I'm glad you're, you're oh, relatively okay. Breaking, a, I've broken a couple of fingers over the course of my, uh, my life. And that's a pain in the finger. Gail says, I still often use an underwash with my watercolors. That's great. That's good to hear. Because there's definitely um, many people will do that. But there's also many people who use watercolors and don't put any kind of wash on there. Um, I'm, I'm miserable at watercolors. I think watercolors is the most difficult material ever invented. So I've <laughs> kind of... Um, I've, I'm, I, one of these days I'm going to take a class just like this on how to use watercolors. But I'm the last person you want to have it, <laughs> to listen to advice from on how to use watercolors. So, okay. Um, let's look at this. And I'm thinking, I'm going to, uh, I think this is still a little tacky, so I'm going to blow dry it. And then, um... 
I think I'm going to use, we're going to, I'm going to finish a little, do I want to finish the, the background? Um, yeah, it might be nice to get the background done, right? Sometimes it is nice to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do some other stuff before I get to back to the background here. I'm gonna paint. Um, I'm gonna paint her, and then we'll come back to the background. I think that's what I'm gonna do. Okay. Sometimes I just. Sometimes it. Yeah. I always prefer to to capture everything and have everything evolving simultaneously. So let's do. Let's do her clothing. That's going to be an interesting color. How are we going to mix that color? Because that is a really bright, like, I, this kind of, well, I don't even know what you call that color, like this, um, what is the name of that paint? Um, it's going to drive me nuts now. It's like a teal, but it's... Oh, here, I've, this is teal, but um, it's it's not just teal. It's a ah, I can't think of the name of. Um, anyway, it'll come. Of course, it'll come to me probably two minutes after the class ends. But okay, so to make a teal, uh, let me see. Let's get a smaller brush here. We're we're basically going to use um, our cool yellow and cool blue, maybe a little bit of white. And potentially even a little bit of warm blue here. So let's how about we mix this over here in this, this brush. Okay. So my cool blue and cool yellow. Let's steal some uh, the yellow, or sorry, the white. All right, and then, so it's kind of, right now it's got a very greenish quality. We're just going to add more blue into here. And you see how, like, I kind of pull a little bit of color in at a time? I don't just kind of... It's always easier to figure out the proportions with a small batch. Okay. That's pretty close, right? Again, the benefit, too, of having this warm ground down here is even if I put down a, a, um, a cool color, like we, we've got a cool teal is, is is generally a cool color but because it's on top of this yellow the yellow is going to just sort of help push that cold color which otherwise might want to recede it kind of helps push it forward right now of course you're going to say this well we didn't we paint cool colors in the background yes but that's why we're going to do maybe something else on top of here to help push it backwards okay so Actually, you know what? I'm going to put some um, glazing fluid in here. Oh, okay. Cap fell off. I was going to see that this is pretty thick and opaque, so I want to make it a little bit more transparent so it goes on a little bit more like watercolors and inks. There we go. And that way I can blend it a little bit better. I just realized I missed this should be my white.
And then there's this little bit down here that, you know, is cut in our paper, our original, um, the tracing that we did kind of ended here, right? So you could decide how you want to approach this down here. Do you want her dress to go a little bit further down? I'm going to do that and maybe leave a little bit on this side. Oh, I didn't even... Okay. <laughs> Already a little bit different than the original. I forgot this edge, this corner here. Okay. There's a few things I missed. That's what's good about doing this now is I can fix these while we're right here. So I want to get this with some white again that I missed. And then this darker color down here that I also missed. I'm just going to wipe some of this away here. I got a bit of white in there when I wiped the paint away. Anyway, we can play with all of these things as we develop it, right? So we're not locked in either. Um, okay. Oh, and I forgot that there I see that there's some... We can use that same color in the background or the leaves up here the flowers. You can see, like, I'm not being overly concerned right now of getting the original kind of shapes or anything in there. I just want to get some color in because I'm going to put some more color over top of all everything that we've painted so far. And like I've said dozens and dozens of times over the course of the past eight months that we've been painting together, don't over don't worry about your painting at this stage it's just because it's just so early in its production that you know because i you know every time i paint in person with people there's people who, who are obsessed about making it perfect at this stage and i think oh, you still got a lot of ways to go if it's like you're never going to finish and it doesn't matter you're going to paint over almost everything you've just done anyway so you know, you're going to have, like, a really perfect painting that is hidden under... Like, so you could say, well, you know, yeah, the painting doesn't look that great now, but boy, oh boy, uh, you, the, if you could peel off this top layer of paint, you, the stuff that was underneath was fabulous. <laughs> okay. Um... Gail says, Ah, oh, Deb, you are so funny. Don't break too many fingers or you won't be painting. <laughs> Glad you're okay to laugh about it. Deborah says, Thanks, Gail. It was painfully funny. Gail says, I did something similar with my sis on cross country skis once. We fell and laughed so hard we couldn't get up. <laughs> I've been there. Skiing is an exhausting experience. Uh, it's fun, but I don't really ski. I haven't skied for years because it's like, man, that is like, it's the hardest. Uh, fun hardest work to have fun ever 
Uh, and Gail says, Michael, the painting in the Dropbox of the opera reminds me of Cubism. It certainly does. And he was he was there at ground zero when it was happening. Um, he, he would have met Picasso and Brock and the other Cubists. Uh, everyone was sort of experimenting with it at that time in Paris. Um, although... You know, Picasso was one of the first persons to sort of abandon Cubism. He's, he helped invent it, and then then when everyone else started doing it, he sort of just gave it up, uh, moved on. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he would have definitely been very influenced by that, as it, w it would have been pretty hard not to have been. But but great to point that out. I, that's, uh, you know... Um, okay. So, let's... If we look here... Let's do... You know what? I, I could have painted this dark as well. It's one of these things that... Sometimes I... I wonder... Probably would do many things differently if I wasn't live on camera making these paintings, but sometimes I just space out or... Anyway, so I'm going to paint this here, which is going to obscure some of the things underneath it but if I if I've got like some of that glazing fluid in there or some kind of medium mixed in my paint it's gonna make it a little bit more transparent and I'll see some of the stuff that was there um, okay so what should we do next let's in fact, let's go back to a bigger, bigger brush. I'm going to add some white into the teal. Uh, oops, I guess we want to keep it here. So I'm going to take some more white. I'm going to put this white off to the side here. And then I'm going to scoop just a bit of teal in. So then, we'll just this way we can get a slightly different color in this zone here. You know, if you were using watercolor or inks, you would just dilute your teal to get something like this, assuming you're painting on white paper, obviously, right? Because the white of the paper just acts like adding white paint to your color. I'm going to do this same thing, take the same color, put it up here, and you know I'm going to take this same color and put it in this thing that she's holding. I think it's like a fan, maybe? Uh, let's put a little bit of that in the ribbon in her hair, too. Okay, I think that's, that's good. Uh, Heidi says the documentary Michael posted on Facebook is very well made and helpful for understanding Lean's art. Thank you for, for um, mentioning that, Heidi. Yeah, great documentary. Okay, so let's mix um, a... No, I just realized we could also... For... I'm going to put the same color for her hair, actually. This darker color that we made for the background here. I'm just going to use this for her hair. And obviously I'm going to paint this in much darker later on, but... 
or at least I I think I'm going to. I, I well I will, but I was planning on using black for this, but maybe I'll mix just a really really dark color. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's mix a skin tone here. So the way that we mix any any skin tone of for any person, let's uh, is basically we we make a an orange. So let's let's mix a bit of a bigger batch here. So I'm going to take my warm yellow. I'm going to take my warm red. That's maybe enough. Actually, no, I'm just going to make a little bit more of a mixture here. So I'm taking my warm yellow, warm red. Mix that in pretty well. I'm going to go right over to my warm blue. Let's just put a bunch there. And then we mix these together, and we're going to get a brown. Right? The more blue we put in here, the darker the brown is going to get. The more yellow we put in there, the brighter the color is going to be. The more red we put in there, the the more warmer, kind of reddish it's going to be for like, which is great for, you know, like, um, you know, uh, rosy cheeks, that kind of stuff. Okay, so we got this nice brown here. And then just for and again, this is basically to make any any race on earth is 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 using these colors here. Warm yellow, warm red, warm blue. And then it's just a matter of modifying the amounts that you use to get different types of skin colors, right? Different um, darker, lighter colors, right? So now I'm going to put some white in here. Let's see the color on camera here. Now we're gonna again uh, do a few layers of paint here, so much so that I actually now that I'm thinking about this, I, what I always forget to do is, you know, I'm I'm very comfortable painting the whole face out and then applying the features later on. But I know that probably most people watching me are not comfortable doing that. So uh, if if you're fall into that camp, this is what I suggest you do. I'm gonna get I just put some black paint out onto my my uh, canvas or onto my palette, and then I'm gonna get a very small brush, and I'm actually just gonna paint some of these lines on the face and even potentially on the fingers. Let me think about it. But that way, if I paint things over top of here, I'll have to, I'd have to do a lot of layers to completely hide this black. So it's gonna kind of show through and potentially you might even find it, you don't even need to, to do another layer at the very end to outline things because it's kind of, there is a little bit of a halo effect, right? So uh, I'm just going to, so, oops, and see I got some, I don't know how I got that paint down there on my sleeve or something. Um, so, and these don't have to be perfect because we're going to paint over all of it. But it's going to help me remember where uh, where these lines are later on, right? Mm, 
know, even her, for her lips, I'm just going to do a straight line across, and then later on, I'll put in some red on top of there. Um, you know what, maybe that's worth just doing a little bit of outlining on these fingers. I'm not going to outline everything here, but I mean, you again, you could. And this, you know, this would probably be helpful for people that um, also, if you have like kind of uh, maybe poor eyesight and seeing through some layers of paint can be difficult, right? So having some lines like this can just sort of help reduce some uh, eye strain, I guess, right? And you could do the same sort of thing with white paint. Like we could do... In fact, let's do a little bit of that with white. I'm, I'm just saying we, we could do it, so why don't we just do it, right? Um, I, I'm going to put some white paint on her clothes. It will, this kind of will give us a little bit more sense of being a little more fearless, I suppose, with the way that we apply the paint. I'm going to, in fact, while we've got this dark, I'm going to just take some of this black and also do a little bit of painting in here. Um, do I want to do anything more? The vase, all that's kind of fairly straightforward. Um, yeah, okay. So I think that's good for black. I'm going to do some white outlines. And I know that this is a little bit redundant. For, for maybe a little bit more experienced painters, this is maybe unnecessary. But... Um, if it helps just one person, then that's that's great. So, um, let's see. Because we're probably going to put some of these white lines back over top of things later on, but it might be nice. But you'll it'll help you see where these lines are, because you'll it again, especially if you're using sort of semi-transparent layers of paint. You'll see these lines, even though they're white. If anything, even if you paint over them quite thick, you will probably still see some uh, texture from them, depending on how you paint. And I wouldn't also worry about making them look too perfect either, right? They can be a little bit sloppy, like the way that I'm painting right now. You see, I'm getting some paint stamping around here with my hands, making a bit of a, a mess, but we'll paint over all of this. Where did this one go? This goes here. And, uh, you know, again, I'm not saying this is how he would have have done done this. This is just as part of, like, a, 
the how to paint kind of like a teaching kind of tool. And so if you feel confident that you can find the image even after it's been covered with another layer of paint, then just skip ahead. Okay. Um, I think that's probably good for right now. I mean, I could do some of the, the leaves in here, but we've got this paint mixed up for the face already. So, and I just, look it up. let's go back into here and look at this mixture. So right now this has a bit of, um, it's a little still like, gr like green or not green, sorry. Um, uh, orangey reddish color. So if I take a bit more blue, it'll just give it a bit more of a darker quality. And just like all the other layers, we're probably going to put more paint on after this. So don't worry about making it perfect. Just get yourself into the ballpark. I, I use that saying all the time. i got to investigate where that comes from. I'm assuming that's a baseball term. Okay, is this all dry? Okay, so now I can just paint over all of this. In fact, I'm gonna paint a little bit She's got this kind of clear shawl or something kind of goes over. Heart's just going to come up here, a little bit further down. And there. And I know you're, you're, some people are like, oh, that's, that's definitely not the right color for her face. And it's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Because the other thing too is I'm going to add more white on in the next layer and it'll be more opaque. Basically her skin in this painting is the is really the the most opaque part of this whole painting. Right? Everything else is relatively transparent. Um while uh you know her the, her actual hands and face are, are uh, you know, they're, they're not transparent, they're opaque. Okay, cool. Now, before I wash my brush, again, I'm going to take a little scan and take a look around and think, Okay, do I need this color anywhere else? I could do, while I've got this on my brush, you know, I'm going to just go in here. And there's these kind of like leaves. And these are going to be a little bit darker color. Or they're going to probably paint like a green over top of them afterwards but this again will help me see them a little bit through subsequent layers of paint and let's just see anything down here Do a little bit of texture in here. Yeah, 
And is there anything in the background that he painted darker up there? I can't really tell. But you know what? I'm just going to put a few... I always think it's just nice to have, especially in big solid areas, just a little bit of something, something, something. Okay. So, let's now see where we're at. I'm going to clean up my brushes. I think we're doing really well with time. I don't think I'm going to paint the other paintings today. Otherwise, I'm just going to be here all night again. But, um... I do the other that that painting um, that Gail was talking about that has some cubist qualities. I really like that series series of paintings. And it was actually just like all the other Chinese artists we've looked at. They are it's very hard to find um, at least in the Vancouver Public Library, which again is the largest public library in Western Canada. There was virtually no books on many of the artists that we've talked about and that we will talk about, even though they're like, you know, huge cultural figures back in China. Um, and and even on the like, so finding high resolution images of some of those paintings is really, really hard. Um, I should uh, there's probably some books at the Emily Carr Library where I teach the university um, but it is like <laughs> trying to get on campus is is like trying to access I'm sure it's easier to get into a, a nuclear facility than it is to get um, into the university okay another thing I, today I was like you know, it's one of these days where today I thought, like, okay, everything's fine. And then just as we're about to go live, I'm like, oh, I forgot to uh, wax my mustache. I forgot to put my wedding ring after I got out of the shower on. There's, there's always something that is a little bit, um, that, uh, that surprises me for every episode. Um, okay. Where should we go back to now? I think let's go we've got basically everything is in place this would be if I was painting in oil paints this would be probably where I would call it a day and then I'd probably leave this for a few days and then do paint on it again um, so this is you know if, this would be what a, a completed underpainting would look like um, and then we're gonna now paint on top of all of this so let's think about the background here. In fact, maybe I'm going to blow dry it. So just to lock everything in before we move on to the next step. For the to do more on this background, what brush do I want to use? Let's still stay in this relatively large brush. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this color and I'm going to add a little bit of of the warm blue to it. 
which is going to make it a darker color. And then I'm also going to take some of the cool blue in here that's just going to keep it dark, but keep it bluish. Right, so it's probably, you know, it looks really, really dark right now. This isn't the darkest color that I could get. If I wanted to get this really, really dark, um, I could then take some of the reds and put those in here, and boom, it's just going to go about as dark as you can make it without actually using black. So, now, let's see. Actually, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll usually try to do this side first. So that I, let's go over here. So you see how those kind of these those weird little things I just kind of did that kind of look maybe like leaves? They kind of just add like this weird little thing underneath there that's been painted over. Because in all honesty, it looks like he did do some stuff underneath there and then erased it, changed his mind. And so those little details are things that I think we forget to include when we're trying to reproduce an artist's work like this. I think I might make this area darker once it all dries. But now I can just paint right over this. Oh, that's gorgeous. I love it already. Okay. And I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm just going to paint right over top of all of these little leaves that I painted. Because I can still see them. Which is the beauty of using the same this kind of process, right? Okay. Cool. So I'm uh, should I blow dry that right now? Let me think about it. Uh, you know what? I'm also just gonna take this brush and I'm just gonna kind of lightly go down, and make some like folds. See how it's kind of this dry brush? All right, we're going to paint white over top of it, but it's just going to give it this little bit like there's a little shadow. What I'm gonna, I'm kind of having a little bit of fun here. Maybe I'm losing my mind a bit, but I'm gonna continue this because we're gonna paint over this anyway. Well, let's just see what some of this looks like later. So this is I'm basically I'm using a dry brush technique here. This is the the 
the paint that's just but you know my brush is is kind of like what it sounds like almost dry right and I'm just sort of dragging it on the canvas if you find your brush is, is still really wet you could just take a rag wipe your brush off a little bit and then now you've got like a really dry brush and so I just did that and then I can just sort of go into an area of my paint that's maybe kind of wet and then one thing like if you're worried just try on the back of your hand do a little bit of that Okay, I feel, uh, feel pretty good about that. Do I want to do any more? I think that's good. <laughs> okay. Now, I mean, things are coming along well enough that, you know, I, I, I what I like about this sort of process is, you know, worse comes to worse. This painting could be done, right? Like, obviously, it's not, I'm not, I'm not going to, say it's done right now but potentially depending on the way that you apply the paint it could be done like uh, you know which is uh, which is I think is a, a what you generally want when you're making art is is for you to always sort of feel like huh wow there's still a bunch more things I want to do to it but I, I could walk away right now and feel pretty happy um, and rather than having, let's say, doing the flowers here and just nailing that and nothing else, there's no paint anywhere else on the canvas, and then going, okay, now I'm going to do the face. Mmm, the face is beautiful, but n I got now flowers and a face and nothing else is done. I'd rather have everything developing together like a Polaroid or something, right? Okay. Um... Ace says, sorry, Michael, what colors for the curtain? I'm lost. Um, for the curtain, what we did is we used cool yellow, cool blue, and white, right? Because, um, well, uh, oh, and I think some uh, cool red. Yeah, so we used cool yellow, cool blue, and cool red. So we made a really dark color here. Basically, it was like a brown. If you find it, it's too brown or too purpley, it just means you've got a lot of uh, the, too much red. And so just I would just add a little bit more cool blue to it. If you find it's, it's too um, greenish, that means you've just got a little bit too much yellow. So just add more blue to it, and it'll, it'll get darker and darker. Obviously, when you add white to it, because the way we made the, the curtains is we just took the same color and we just added more white to it. Now, when we added, um, okay, so, so sorry, let me go back. To, to, to do the background, what we did is cool yellow, cool blue, cool red. We mixed that up and we painted it. And then to do the curtains, I just added white to it. And when we added white to it, it did look a little bit on the greener side, almost like the, the teal did when we added it, right? Um, so often, one way that you can... Um, uncover what the color really is is by adding white to it it helps you kind of especially when you have a darker color and you're like wow what is that you add white to it, you're like oh it's a brown oh it's a gray or whatever right um so speaking of which let's just take this color that we have right here let's i'm going to put it right back in the middle and let's add some more white to it And then I'm going to use some glazing fluid just to get it, give it that transparency again. Okay. So we've got our our this again. So this is the same color we put in the background with just white in it. All right. So now we can just paint this 
back over top and even over top of those dark lines that I painted there moments ago. Right all the way up to the bottom down there. Inside here. Don't be afraid to get paint over a little bit of the fingers or anything like that. That's why we added that black there to help. see things through the edge. Like, you know, you see me painted a little bit over on these edges. Not a big deal, because I can always just take that, my darker color for the curtains, and paint that over any of those areas as well. Um, let's see. Let's go back into these flowers. Vase. See how, like, I'm painting and I'm going out of the lines in a few different places? That's totally fine, because if you look at his painting, there is this, there's a kind of a fuzziness in between some of the, where the colors are clearly overlapping back and forth, like in the curtains, you know, like in these areas here, like colors are overlapping a little bit. I right, remember he's figuring it out as he's going. Okay. Um, so I'm going to leave that there, and then let's do her clothing again. So now I'm going to take... Uh, Okay, so now I'm just going to take the same color we used before. I think it still works. And that color again, to do the teal, was cool yellow and cool blue with white. I added a little bit of warm blue in there. In fact, if I just look at it right now, I think it'll be okay. We'll, we'll see if we need any as we go here. See, isn't it kind of nice to have those white lines underneath? 
that way, imagine trying to kind of find some of those lines that we originally traced onto the canvas. At this point, they'd be gone, right? And you may even really, you could, especially with this particular painting, um, I'm, I already know that I'm going to just leave some of these white lines just like that. That I'm not even going to bother painting on them a second time. Um, because I kind of like the ghosted out look of them. So let's do this um, part of the outfit. So to do that, I'm just going to take my, my paintbrush and just wipe away the paint. I'm not going to clean it. And we've got some white here, so let's just put a little bit more white in, and a bit of, just a little bit of glazing fluid in here. Mm, I think I need more white. So if I add, I don't want to put too much white in, because otherwise it's just going to go white, 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 white and it'll be super opaque, so I'm adding the glazing fluid to give it that transparency again. Now, I can't remember who I, I apologize, but somebody, I had a little bit of a uh, exchange with someone in the group over the weekend about different kinds of white that you can use. Um, so there's a few, mo the most common white that you can buy, let me see if I, I can, I have, a, the most common white that you can buy is titanium white. Um, titanium white is, it's, it's the most common um, easy to find white there is. It's it's usually the one that most art supply stores will stock the most of because it's used um, uh, by most artists. That's what they want. The, the main feature of titanium white is its uh, covering capacity. That it, it, you can, if you mix uh, titanium white into a paint it it makes it instantly more, um, it tints it really quickly so it it like the teal it goes lighter quickly and it covers up anything else it's a very very opaque white um, and it's probably the most opaque of any color that exists out there that, off the top of my head so titanium white is very popular for that reason because if you make a mistake with titanium or with any color, you paint a little bit of titanium white on it and you, it's like erasing that mistake. However, there that's not the only white that exists out there. Just like we have all these different other, many different greens and reds, etc. There's also different kinds of white. Um, I got all these paintings all over the floor. Can I see if I can... just out of reach there but there's um, a few other there's flake white and zinc white uh, there's one other one that just escapes me um, but flake white and zinc white what is great about those paints is they're far less opaque than titanium white zinc white is actually almost semi is semi transparent so it, it is, it's, I I'm, I'm won't even get into how to, to paint with it, but it is a fun material to use because it acts totally different than titanium white. And if you're doing a lot of transparency while you're painting, you could use zinc white in your paint and then you wouldn't have to use glazing medium to, to, to thin it out. Um... But I don't want to overwhelm everyone with, you know, another uh, another material or tube or all that kind of stuff. 
but it is, there's there's always something more to learn when it comes to paint. Okay. And again, I apologize. I can't remember who I had that conversation with, but I, I always appreciate those kind of more technical questions when it comes to art. Um, because, and I, I try to remember them to, to bring them up during classes when I can. Um, okay. You know what? I'm, I'm, I was going to do more stuff in the background here, but I think I am just going to move forward here. So let's do these flowers, or at least the... Um, The leaves, I guess, and behind these flowers. Probably do another layer of something uh, of like a. I'll add some more blue into this color shortly here. So now I'm starting to kind of shape these blobs of color a bit. And I'm not even looking at the original, I'm just thinking to myself. How can I just give these flowers a little bit of just cut in a little bit? Oh, and I look. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, I think I'm on the road. Okay. So, that's good, that's good, that's good. I think one of the final things we'll do is the dark blue, the ultramarine blue, these um, tassels, I guess, that are on her hair and, like, a, I don't know if it's like a belt or something on her waist. Well, that'll be probably the final color, among the final colors we'll put down on here. So the next step we'll do is... Um, Actually, you know what? We'll put some white down next. We'll get the white in her hands next, because then we'll do the hands over top of that, and hopefully we'll nail that enough that we can move on from that. Okay, so I'm going to take some white. Oops, I got some green on there. And it's going to, again, take a little bit of slow-dry medium or sorry, uh, glazing fluid, just to thin this out. And then I'm going to paint Brightening up these white shapes in here. And, you know, I've lost some of the 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 shape of that vase, but I'm going to put a little bit more color into that background anyway, so I'm not concerned. Um, I'm going to take a bit more white, pure white here. Okay. 
there. And I think that's good, right? Okay, so I'm going to blow dry this and then we'll mix the color for her face in just a second. Um, so, I was going to, just as, just a, uh, to kind of continue a little bit of the, the biography of Lean, um, that, so he goes to, to France, and he studies, ironically, it's not until he goes to France that he has a teacher there that is like, you come, like, this white teacher who is like, you come from this incredible, um, painting tradition like there's the chinese painting tradition is like super rich you should study more of the, the chinese um history of painting and he's like oh well, i kind of came all the way across the ocean to study how you guys paint but whatever and at the there was a pretty good collection of um chinese ceramics and painting in the museums in paris so he actually <laughs> Just takes him. He ends up studying Chinese art in the museums when he's in Paris. He writes about how uh, how how it wasn't until he left China that he got interested in Chinese art. Um, so he he learns a lot more about like traditional Chinese painting and techniques and uh, motifs, etc. While he's there, um, and he incorporates that into his painting. So he's you know, in this, you know, Paris in 1920 is, you know, pretty much like it is the it is literally the epicenter of art, right? So he is there at at the ground zero for you know cubism and fauvism and all of. I mean, even though those movements did begin earlier, you know, about 10, 15 years before that, their roots. But he's that really the, it began then, but it wasn't until kind of the, you know, 1920 where it really starts spreading outwards from that small group of, of, of artists. Anyway, so he's there, he's, he experiences all of that. He goes to Austria or Berlin and he, he meets this woman out there, um, a, a Aust again, Austrian or German woman. I can't remember her name. Um, maybe I should bring up the Wikipedia page. And while he's there, they fall in love. They get married. Sh see, there's not much info here on the biography. Um, uh, yeah, so here's here's this teacher who tells him to study, you know, Chinese art. Um, but while he's there, he he marries this woman. They have a child. And soon after the baby is born, she uh, gets an infection and dies. So this his wife, um, uh, who was like a fairly wealthy person, uh, f uh, kind of a, from an aristocratic family in in uh, Germany or Austria, I think, uh, she dies. And then soon after that, their daughter dies as well. Right, which is like as a father and a husband of a of a two-year-old upstairs almost two years like i just can't even like that would just be crushing and he's on the other side of the world there's not a lot of chinese people in in um paris uh especially not studying art right um so he like talk about just feeling completely isolated on the other side of the planet and the love of your life just died 
Um, and so while he's there, he does meet another woman, and they they get married, but they um, they don't really spend too much time together. He while he's there, he is convinced by oh, I'm not even sure. Like, um, I don't know how to. S I think it's t uh, Tai Wan Pei. Um, is is kind of a powerful figure within like the educational community in in China and is in in Paris at the time, and he encourages. He basically says, "Come back to China. You're 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 25 years old, I think, at the time, and I'll make you the head of the National College of Art." Right, so it's like wow. Oh, you're, so basically, becoming one of the most powerful persons in the art world back in China. So he's like, well, my wife just died. I just got married to this other woman, but you know, it's kind of a odd relationship here. So okay, sure, I'll take you up on your offer. So he sails back to China. He gets back to China and he he brings all of this art that he's been making while he's been away for the past five six years in Paris. And he starts a magazine, kind of to, to help spread these ideas of kind of Western um, avant-garde art throughout China. And he, as I said, he become he's now the head, the the director of this major, uh, like the art school in China. And he hires a number of other artists, um, in, including Chi Bei Chi, the artist we talked about last week, really kind of who at this time is a little bit older. Uh, and is like the god of painting in China. He hires him to, to help teach the students. Um, and <laughs> uh, in my own experience, being I was the president of our faculty association at our university, and the politics of any university are, are intense. And he got caught up in all of that and, and was forced out after like eight, nine months. Right, and that was a disaster. And then he gets hired again to do an, to, to another school, and that goes poorly as well because he keeps trying to introduce. He, he want, really sees he wants to blend these these different um, uh, 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 traditions, East and West, together. Right, and initially everyone's like, "Yeah, it sounds like a great idea," but. Then there's some people who are like, oh, you're too Western or you're too Chinese, you're too progressive or you're too retrograde. And so he basically becomes like the figurehead for all of these different factions within China as to what art should be. And so he gets forced out of that. Uh, and so he's given up everything that he had in Europe to come back to China and now has been kind of screwed over twice. And um, so now we're talking like early 1930s. He, I, um, I think he's he's pretty despondent because he's been trying to do this, have this big effect, and it's not going according to plan. And then what happens? World War II breaks out. The Japanese invade China, and he kind of flees into the countryside. And while he's away, the Japanese soldiers take over his house and they turn it into a barracks and they basically destroy everything in there. They destroy all of his art, right? The art that he's been making since he got back to China and, uh, and anything he made in France while he was there. So basically all of the art that he had made throughout the course of his life is now basically gone. Whatever, the only things that survive really are things that uh, people had bought from him and were in other collections that also weren't destroyed by the Japanese, right? So, and I'm not even done yet with the tragedy. I'm going to continue painting for a bit, and then we'll talk about the, uh, like, I mean, so so we hear poor guy, his mother, uh, he, he was almost killed, his mother saved him, then his mother is almost killed, he saves his mother, but then his mother is sold into slavery, then he manages to get a lottery ticket uh, that's that you know changes his the course of his life and his family's life. Goes to Europe, has this incredible experience. Comes back because convinced, or, or then his wife and daughter die, marries again, moves back to China, 
Uh, and then everything goes wrong when he goes back to China. And then World War II breaks out. Japanese destroy everything. Okay. Now we're at the 1940s. The guy lives for another 50 years, right? So there's still lots more. Like, if you thought the bottom, right, there's more more to come here. Okay, so let's which, oh, well, let's do the, the, um, the face again. So... Clean these brushes a little bit better here. Uh, or actually, let's use a bit of a bigger brush. I always find it's a little bit easier to use a bigger brush to, to mix colors and then go down to a smaller brush. Okay. Excuse me. So, to get this color, let's just sort of mix the skin tone again. We're going to take warm yellow. Warm red, let's mix that up. We got it. an orange, right? And then we have some warm blue. So all warm colors so far here, right? And then we're going to take white. And then with this next layer, we're we'll probably have a little bit more white than we had in there before. We're going to a little bit more yellow in here just to warm it up. It was a little bit dark before. Oops. Okay. Let's keep on going. I'm going to move over to the side here. Let's take a bit more blue in. Too much red. There you go. So I, you make all that color, and then now you got to kind of do it again. Okay, so let's add a bit more yellow in here. A lot more white. So really just using warm red, warm yellow, and a little bit of warm blue. I'm modifying these colors. Put a bit more white in here. Okay. And then I'm going to use some glazing fluid. I'm going to put a bunch in here so that I can add as much or as little color to this as I want. And I can add layer after layer and change my layers from layer to layer, right? Okay, just put the brush down. Let's go to a smaller brush. So what I think I need next is a little bit more blue in the next layer. Right, because this is quite red. There's it's a very reddish kind of color that I just put down.
Um, so I'll let this, I'm going to blow dry it, and then we're just going to add a little bit more blue back in here just to take away some of the, the warmth. go back here. Let's take some of this warm blue. Let's put that to the side. And I'm just going to mix this warm blue in here. Because what the... It, it's, maybe it's hard to kind of see, but there, the, this color, there's a bit of like almost a greenish slight greenish quality, right? So now you can can you see how adding that blue to it just sort of takes away some of the the, the redness out of here. Now I'm not going to paint this everywhere because the color that we have here is actually kind of a really nice um, uh, like it works well for kind of the, the blush in her face kind of thing, right? So we can again use this as a glaze and and paint on here. So let's now go. Oops, I think I need a little bit of white back into here. Otherwise it's gonna get too dark. That's a little bit too much white. <laughs> it's always a bit of a give and a go, isn't it? There, I think we're we're good now. And I think you know what? I'm just gonna paint over everything and we'll put a little bit of blush back onto her face afterwards. But I'm paint. This is against. I'm glazing with this, so it's kind of a, a semi-transparent layer of paint. So we put this kind of a bit of a little bit more of a greenish brown over top of that color that was there, and it's kind of shining through a bit. The the under color is coming through, um, warming up. And it's really hard to do this just by mixing the, this color directly and applying it directly without having layers of paint kind of informing this color. It's, one of just, it's just like the mystery of how the eye perceives color. Now remember, we're going to paint some black outlines on this. So sometimes it's a little bit hard to um, to see this color for what it really is without th these other lines on top of here. Great thing with glazing is 
is if I want something to be a little bit brighter, I just put a little bit more on top of it. It's just like adding an extra little coat of paint. I want to be careful not to, to overdo it, otherwise it's going to... I'll just paint over all that nice warmth that's underneath the skin here, so I think that's probably good. Although, I see he does use this same color. I guess I want something a little bit darker. Okay. So, you know, the, those lines that I put on the face, they're almost gone, but I think as I when I blow dry it, I'll get that a little bit of that color, those lines will come back. Question. So Lori in the chat says, could you go straight to the more blue skin color? Is it important to have the red under? Um, you know, it's it, it's an interesting question because it's kind of a much bigger question than it, it might appear. That is almost a philosophical approach to painting. Um, the The easy, the quick answer is kind of. <laughs> is yes, you could, um, but there's, I, I just think it won't have quite the depth and the richness you'll have when you're layering some colors, because it's, it's this really weird thing when you, if you can paint one color and, and then you paint another one that's just a little bit thinner over top, a little bit more transparent, then you see both colors simultaneously, and they mix inside of your head. Um, and it's one of those things, you, you hear painters talk about how my paintings don't photograph that well. You have to see them in person kind of thing. It's one of the reasons why people love seeing the Mona Lisa in person. Um, it, cause it, or any of those older classical paintings, which you use a lot of layering techniques is that there's a, there's a, like almost a, a life that they have because there's like something glowing from within. Now on YouTube, you'll see tons. I would say that 95% of the painters do just paint. They take a white canvas and they just paint, they mix the colors exactly as to what, they see in a photograph or from a painting, and then they paint them in little, like almost like little puzzle pieces, just interlocking colors together. And it it works. You know, there's people with like far more views than I do here. Um, it's and the paintings can be pretty good. I've seen great paintings done that way. I I actually think though that once you understand this method which is the, the, the classical way of painting, I think it's actually easier to paint this way. It, 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 it is a little bit of a, uh, a, a learning curve. I, I grant you that, absolutely. And it, it it's, takes a while for your, your mind to kind of come around as to how, as to, how to make it work. And, and I, I can understand why some people are like, okay, I can do this when he's teaching me, and when he's there doing it, I can follow along. But, man, if I try to do this on my own, it's that's a whole other... I can I totally get that. That's why I just want to keep on painting and painting, trying to do as many things so that, it's, especially if you're painting, then you start to sort of absorbing it, and you can start 
maybe taking a little bit of steps on your own to replicate some of this. Um, I just think there's just something that having multiple layers of, of paint, thin layers of paint, just adds something that is just, you just can't quite get any other way. Anyway, um, I'm going to, so you can see some of these lines have now disappeared in the face. So let's Let's take a look. I just got a, a new, brand new lens for, for my overhead here so I can zoom in nice and close. Closer than I was able to do, about twice as, three times as what I was able to do before. So now I'm much closer. So we can kind of see some of these lines are still here. But some of them are have gone, right? And so I would just sketch it out with a pencil. Okay. So now let's. Uh, and, uh, oh, Lori says, as you talked, I think you answered my question. <laughs> so you may have asked me that question a while ago and it took me a while to get to it, but uh, I'm glad finally, finally I was able to do it. Okay. Wow. We are so close. <laughs> now I might have to back out. Um, I'm going to, uh, let me see, how, how do I want to do this? Uh, we could use, we could mix this color. I think I'm just going to use a, a black, just in terms of time. You, you can, or let's, I'll, I'm, why I'm, why I'm being lazy. Let's, we're going to mix a, a really dark color, and then we can kind of see it side by side, the black. So let's back this back up. Okay, so I'm gonna take my warm blue. I'm gonna take my warm, my cool blue. So now I got two blues in here. Basically, by doing that, right there on the color wheel, they're sort of separated, right? And this is just sort of now the blues that would be in between these two blues, right? So, but by also mixing them together, I'm gonna to get a darker color. So I mix these two together. Now let's take a warm yellow going all the way across the color wheel. And then let's take a warm red. So we mix these up. And we got a nice warm, this is a, a, a warmer brown. Let's put a bit of cold red in here. Right, so now we've got like a really nice dark, 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 dark color. And I'm actually going to use this color. And I might just use a little bit of black at the very end. Just because I, I, I just always prefer... Because right... Okay, now right, this is... What, it's kind of almost like an eggplant color is what I would call that. Like a really dark, dark purple. All right, so if it's too purpley, let's take a little bit of cool yellow and add that to it and that takes it from the purple and makes it a little bit more on the brown side of things if I was to take some white and add let's just take some white and mix it into here and you can see it just basically goes gray right I don't, I don't know why I did that because I don't think I want any gray, but you, I just wanted to kind of show you 
what the color actually looks like because it can be kind of hard when I'm mixing black or dark colors to actually see what that color is. Just wipe the... Okay. So let's do... I'm going to do her eyes. Um, maybe I'll even do her hair like this right now. Now, is everything dry before I start rubbing, leaning on this canvas here? Yeah, where did that come from? Okay, I think that's where the bow is going to go. I don't know where... Sometimes that happens, like, especially if the paint is not quite dry, it can kind of cause these little lumps or things to kind of just stick to it. Um... Something's coming off of my hands. Um, if that's a, a big problem, you can always just take like a cloth, assuming it's nice and clean, and just putting it down on top of the canvas so that your hand has something to rest on. That because um, even I think like the oils from our hands or the sweat from our hands that can just wants to stick to the plastic of the canvas. Turn on an extra light here. One second.
And you know what? I'm going to add a little bit of glazing fluid. So that these the marks around the nose are going to be just a little bit thinner. Okay, so you see how I kind of got those lines a little bit close together? Well, I'm just going to take a bit of the skin color. You can kind of shape the eyes a little bit more, depending on how... It's going a little bit brighter than I expected, but actually I don't mind it. <laughs> it's just got a bit of... Uh, some eye shadow going on there. Oh, well... I kind of like that, actually. It's pretty subtle. Like, it's, I think it's a little bit more obvious on camera than... So I'm just going to take it... ...and run with it. And then take my mop brush, my blending brush. Let's try it up. That hair wasn't dry, Michael. Oh, goodness, goodness gracious. That's not good. What was I thinking? I didn't even think about that. Okay, well, remember you can learn what not to do just by watching these episodes. Ay, 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 ay. Just gonna soak up any extra. Okay, now I'm just gonna go back to my darker color again. Uh, Lori says, I love the close-up. It's so much easier to see what you're doing. Ah, cool. That's good. Thank you for the feedback. I mean, you can see, like, how tiny these details are, right? It's the size of my f fingernails, basically, where we're, where we're at right now, but... Um, and I'm... You know what? I'm, 
I've been debating whether I want to do more to the background. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it. Uh, I'm just going to turn this a little bit. Okay, now I'm just going to, I'm mixing a bit of black into this dark color that I have here to get her hair on her forehead. So obviously his version is a, it's a little bit bigger and he's one of the greatest artists of all time. So he's able to get a little bit better details um, than I am. Uh, okay, let's get up here. In fact, let's just get a bigger brush. So the reason I also I mixed that dark color and I was using that dark color to start before I went right to the black is that I'd, I always, in every single case, always want to start... I don't want to go right to black right off the bat because it's such a dark color. I mean, it sounds so obvious, but I want to reserve the black for the darkest, darkest things that I, and, um, and not just, because if I use it everywhere, then how do I get the dark darks? If I've already got, if I'm using the, my darkest color all over the place. It's sort of like using white, right? You want to use it only where you absolutely need it rather than all over the place. Because it's such a dominant color. So I'm just going to paint that white or that the canvas it was showing through. Let's just cover that up even if it's going to slightly change what the original looks like.
Ah, now that I can see so close up, I want to like fiddle with details, but I just have to move on. Okay. Like I think now you can you can see not in, not in mine. I'm not I'm not saying I did mine perfect, but you can really see the much more greenish colors that he used on in her, on her face, right? I don't think I for just time wise I'm not going to be able to have a chance to to do um, to go back and just fiddle with that forever. But ah, oh my goodness, I got a big splotch of black in the middle of my painting here. Wipe that away. So I'm now just uh, I just took some warm red right out of the um, the tube. But I had my black on my brush. I didn't wash my brush. I just dipped my my paint in there. So straight line across. A little bump. Another little bump. And I'm trying to get a nice flat edge on my brush. mouth is significantly bigger now than it was but uh okay so i'm gonna move on let's I'm starting to good thing i didn't try to do three paintings tonight my goodness uh let's do her hands i'll leave the face up there so you can see it And okay. Now you could also do some of this with like a pencil, or I would I would kind of recommend not using sharpies or pens because they will uh, fade over time. But uh, if you just just if you just want to get the painting done, then a pen and, or would work certainly. Now I've gone back to my kind of dark eggplant-like color uh, to do this outlining because again, it's not quite as dark as the black. And it's going to allow me to a little bit more freedom when I'm outlining things that it's not going to be quite as dark. And if I do want to emphasize something, I want to make it dark, I can always do that. But I'd rather have that extra little step in my back pocket. Gail says she is beautiful. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know who he was painting. 
who his models were, especially at this stage of his career. Um, at this stage of his career, I'm just going to turn this. He, uh, I think this is the what, late, mid, sometime in the 70s. He has, um, well, actually, you know what, before I, I, I missed, before I get to that, let me catch up on a little bit more history. So he, after World War II, he comes back to his home to, to see that everything is destroyed. And so he sets about starting over again, which, you know, it's not easy for anybody, but, uh, you know, if you're an artist and your entire life's work is, is gone, except for a few things spread around. Uh, and remember, you know, like, so it's just... Uh, and his his wife is, uh, I think, living in Brazil now. The second wife, remember, his first wife died. So he's, um, I think he's kind of like lost. He's his wife's away, and he had a, a couple of kids with his wife who who left. I can't remember why she moved to Brazil, but so he's off on his own. And he's trying to pick up the pieces. And the next thing that happens is the Cultural Revolution in China. And he kind of finds himself the odd man out again. Because... The kind of art that um, Mao and the and the uh, the communist regime preferred is they either wanted artists to make art that was very traditional, um, kind of in the in the manner of uh, Chi by Chi. Uh, which Chi Bai Chi w was a friend of Mao and, and illustrated some stuff by Mao, uh, like poems and things that Mao had written. So he found favor within the, the Chinese government, but the Chinese government saw uh, Lin, Lin Feng Mian, as, as a as a representative of, of like everything that was wrong with like the whole reason why we had to have a revolution in the first place is because of all these people who wanted to be more Western. So here's this guy who just base got his career back up and running after the Japanese destroyed his art. And then he finds himself on the outs again, this time with the Chinese government. And, um, who destroy some of his artwork and um, so poor guy is is uh, a lot of the, the 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 stuff that he devoted his career towards is just not uh, acceptable uh, in the new regime and so he kind of has to start all over again and he's it's because the, there's two two things that that were like the traditional Chinese landscapes were were appreciated, but it was this new social re socialist realist style of painting, which is um, like height like not photorealist painting, but very idealized kind of painting, which ironically is very Western, like you know going it's like a a, a high Renaissance type of painting. And it's, you know, people, happy people, happy workers in the fields, and um, everyone's smiling and, and working towards the common good to support the state. 
and um, uh, it's just not the kind of work that uh, he was that he he almost quite frankly just couldn't make that kind of work, and so he again disappeared for about 20 years and really struggled. He went to Brazil to be with his his wife and kids out there, but they had been away for about a decade, and he just that didn't work out. So he comes back to China and tries to, you know, so he basically ends up living like in a warehouse, almost like, you know, almost homeless until he dies in, I think, 91, I think. So, I mean, it's just one thing after another for that poor guy. Okay, so now as we're getting closer to the end here, I think what I want to do is um, I'm going to take the white now. You know, I'm going to blow dry this because I keep getting stuff all over the place. And I'll just mention, you know, the I'm, I'm able to get a new lens for the camera and upgrade the, the audio and all of this purely by donations that you guys have been so generous of contributing episode to episode. I'm super, super blessed. All the money that, that you guys donate through the PayPal or through e-transfers and checks, it just goes right back into here. It's not going into some my my motorcycle fund or trip to Hawaii. It just goes back into helping make these videos. So thank you for all that. Like this lens is uh, almost a thousand dollars and I bought that just through donation. So if you, if uh, you want to contribute and help make the show even better, there's a link to the PayPal below or send me a, um, an email or Facebook message. And so again, thank you everyone for all of your generosity. I really appreciate it. You know, I'm actually pretty happy with a lot of what's going on here. And it's really up to you to decide how much further you want to take this painting. Obviously, there's, a, there's some things I want to more detail. I'm not, not saying I'm done, but I've, I do think we're pretty close. So let's... Maybe I'll just continue. I'm going to finish off. I'll put some white on here next. So let's just clean this brush. And so the other thing too, we have uh, like her necklace um, and that, that blue. We're going to put white on there and I'm going to put blue over top of it. It's just easier to do it that way. Um, so let's get some more white on the palette. And I'm just going to uh, take the white. I'm going to kind of smudge a bit of it to the side here. So that I've got my main part of the white. And I'm going to mix some with... Uh, glazing fluid just so I have kind of like two whites to work with one being slightly more transparent and then one that's the the full right out of the tube opaque paint All right so uh, and then I can as when I'm dipping my paintbrush into these mixtures I can kind of go back and forth and sometimes I might even have a little bit of both on my on the same brush okay so, 
because again, just like using the black, this allows me to modify. I can go in and go like, you know what, that white is not quite opaque enough. And I could just dip in, get a little bit more of the more opaque white, right? So. Just going to go in here. I don't know if you can hear any of that daughters in this phase where she likes to pick things up and throw them onto the ground. And sometimes it just, <laughs> if I'm not paying attention, like I was just right there, and I hear it, it's kind of, it's a little bit uh, jarring. <laughs> like, oh, what is, what was that? Um, All right, so I tried the first paint that I had when I did this area and painting right here was with a little bit more transparent white, and then I decided, you know what, I think I want it to be a little bit um, more solid. So I just went and just dipped into this more solid one, right? Oops, let me move that over here. I'm not used to having such a close-up view on things, huh? You know, again, it's like little things. I may want to go back over some of those lines later on. We'll see. So I might leave some of these lines underneath here totally alone and not even touch them. Ah, can't see that. So now I gotta keep I have to be so much more aware when I got zoomed in this close as to where I'm actually on, if I'm on camera or not. Ah, you know what, I'm going to zoom out a bit here. wider than I hoped. Mm, do I want to change this color?
like some of these lines just like that. I don't know if I want to go over them too much. So... I think what I'm going to do here is just get, let's zoom back in again. So I'm painting that white, and then I'm going to put in the blue over top of that. Let's just scroll up here. I just want to see down here on her that that blue is to get that I'm going to use I'm going to paint I'm going to glaze this with some white that has a lot of glaze in it so I can get so it's much less transparent. So let's do this. Or it's much more transparent, sorry. And then I think I want a, a little bit lighter t or darker teal in this area here. So I'm going to take my darker color, lighten it up a bit, put a bit of glaze on there. I'm at the bottom of the video screen there, so let's just do this here. Okay, just give it a little bit darker color there, and you know what, I'm going to just put a little bit of white glaze. Okay, 
let's continue our tour around this painting. And... I'm going to go in here, get a little bit of white with some glaze on it. So that's the white with glaze. Okay, now I'm going to take some white right out of the tube. Probably should blow dry this to be honest first before I do this, but if you can see, we'll, you'll see more of a difference when I blow dry it. You'll be able to us do this again, or when it dries, one will be a lot more opaque. Okay, let's come up to the flowers. This is my pure white. Putting in some little bit of highlights while I've got this color fresh on the palette. And I'm just gonna let's while we're right here, I'm gonna take some of this cool blue. I'm going to mix it into where there's a bit of the teal that I had from before. Okay. See how kind of just going a little bit outside of the, the lines a bit onto the dark? Kind of replicates a bit of that look. I'm not going to paint over all of the this kind of tealish green color that was... It was teal, but I remember I painted um, onto the yellow, right? So it has a little bit of a different kind of character. Okay, now I'm going to go, I want this to do a little bit of uh, darkening in the background here. So I'm going to take this same eggplant color that we mixed a while ago, and I'm going to add some glaze to it. That way I can kind of, I can be little bit slower with the way I paint on it and if it goes too dark too quick then I'm not uh, uh, I still have lots of room to play with it right okay so let's just touch up underneath some of these flowers a bit
Now, I'm not going to paint everything here with this. I just want to be kind of careful with my... I just want to kind of integrate maybe a few things and then move on. I'm just, just, just tilt this here and get a smaller brush. You see how some areas are, are more transparent now, so then I can just go to my glaze. Oops, let's just... So I might have to put some more white back on oops to a few of these areas, but Happy with this, I just okay, and then I can use the same gray. Or, or the, I keep calling it eggplant. And I can go in here. And remember, I've got glazing fluid in here, so it's making it lighter. So this is just some cool yellow with a little bit of white. Probably should have painted a little bit of this earlier, but and then glazed over it with this darker color, but it is what it is. Okay. Even go if you want. Just darken around in here a bit. Not 
too much, just kind of on the the bottoms. Okay. Um, I think we're getting close to the end here, folks. So, what do we want to do down here? There's a bunch of little details. Some cool yellow, which is a bit of tiny bit of white in there to help make it stand out a bit more. I'm going to take that cool yellow, mix it in with a little bit of cool red. things in here that I don't think are really I'm kind of kind of making things up because I'm not really sure what it is over here that he's painting. Okay. Oh, I want to come back and do some stuff up in this right corner. So before I move on from all of that, let's just... It's a little bit too bright. So I'm just going to put some glazing fluid to do this so that it will go on, but be, be more transparent. Making a bit of a mess here. Wipe it away and start it over again. This is pretty subtle stuff. But it is, again, it's always this, these, sometimes these details in the periphery of a painting that you don't really think about or even look at that just tell you, oh, this is just kind of an interesting, neat thing.
So we don't want people necessarily spending a lot of time looking in this area. We just want there to be almost an unconscious kind of feeling of when somebody looks at it like, oh, that there's more than just what's in the middle of this woman's face, right? Okay. I guess, oh, you know what, I want to darken that. So I can just clean up little parts that needed to be like that curtain area that I just touched up. Very subtle with the glazing fluid, but I think it makes a big difference personally. Okay, and then let's back out. And I think the last things I want to I'm going to put some white on here, put the blue that needs to go there. And then I think or are we almost done? It's interesting. In my painting, her eyes just appear just a little bit more open than in his original version. Obviously, my hands, I outline them maybe a little bit too dark. I got a little, maybe a little bit of black, more black in there, and a little bit wider, obviously, than the original. But it is what it is, right? Yes. And I'm using white, almost pure white there, to make some of these lines. I think I might just leave that. Let's come back over here.
And now I'm going to use some white with just a little bit of some glazing fluid, just so it's not quite as bright down here. Like pretty subtle. Oh, just as I say that, then I'm a big dark uh, line down there. I'm trying to think of how I want to deal with that background. It kind of drives me a little. Looks a little bit messy to for too messy for my liking. Um, and it's it is a little bit whiter, more white than the original, isn't it? Um, okay. So let's. I'm going to take some of this gray. Let's bring this in here not a lot but taking some of that gray and remember this is just uh, this eggplant color that I mixed earlier put some glazing fluid in it so it thins it out we got some white in here not a lot and then So I should have probably done this earlier. That's why I usually try to get the background sorted out um, earlier in the painting, so that I don't. Because now I might have to go and touch up some of the stuff, like around the hair. And, but Sometimes you don't know what needs to be done until you're at the stage of the painting, and then you see it, and you're like, huh, you know what, I need more of blah, 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 blah. All right, see how I'm just painting right into her hair? And then I'm going to put some black on there shortly.
And, you know, if there's parts that aren't blending as well as you like, I'm just adding some glazing food just to my brush, just as it is, without adding, dipping more paint in it. And I can just kind of try to use it to smooth out the paint that's already on the canvas. Okay. Um, now just some touching up on some of the places I was just fiddling with. And we're almost done. White. Now let's take care of the black that needs to be adjusted in any places. Uh, Lori asks, what is she holding? I think she's holding, um, like a, possibly a fan or a flower. It's a good question. You know, it's, it's, it's so interesting, like the irony that at some point in his life, towards the latter half of his life, like, the only things that he could really paint without getting in trouble with the authorities were these paintings of his mother. Well, as many people believe, paintings of his mother. The woman that he lost so early in his life. And when... He was also kind of lost himself. This is this is where he turned. Oh, it just you know, it's a good reminder of how easy some of us have it compared to how some uh, other people have, what they've had to go through in their lives. Oh man, you know and. Today, he's now been fully rehabilitated back into the canon of, of Chinese art. There's big exhibitions of his recently that happened in China. So he's no longer an outcast. He's seen as, as the great artist that he was. But... Uh, he was never really able to, he, he never lived to see that, this moment. Which is one of the great tragedies. I 
think we may have talked about it before, but there's a great clip um, from the British television show Doctor Who where they meet up with Van Gogh and they take Van Gogh, he, they time travel with him and they go to the, I can't remember which museum, but they take, Doctor Who takes Van Gogh to a museum and they see it's an exhibition of Van Gogh's work and they just see all the people who love his work and it's it's pretty hard not to to um, get emotional watching that considering the struggles that he went through as well right he was likewise also kind of not appreciated I think I just want to touch up those fingers. Do I have any paint left here that I can use to touch up these fingertips? I'm going to go back over with black on them, but before I even do that, I'm just going to add a bit of this blue. Probably have blow dried this first to help. Um, oh, I see a little bit of blue in here that I never noticed. Dry that and almost done.
in, in case anyone's interested to see the... Gail says, a lotus. That's probably a pretty good, pretty good guess. It does sort of look like that shape, doesn't it? Hmm. Oh yeah, just a tiny little bit in her hair. <laughs> I am really dragging my feet on this painting, but I really like this painting, so... Kind of, it's like one of those, like, ah, uh, you know, I don't mind putting in an extra little bit of time to f finish it, because... There's always little things more that I see, including... A couple little stripes there. Okay, I think I'm done. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just paint on this thing all night long. Okay. So, I feel pretty good about... This, so oh, I'm, I'm just going to do one tiny little thing. Okay. All done. I think that I see things the more I look at it that I want to do. There's obviously a little bit more shadows and things going on in the clothes, but I'm I'm pretty happy. I don't think it's going to get that much better in the next 20 minutes. Everyone's having dinner upstairs, and here I am still down here, so... Wow. <laughs> that makes me so happy. Huh. Um, deceptively simple, or, or deceptively complex painting. I don't know which way you want to think about it. You know, it's, and I think that is kind of, you know, Chinese painting, Japanese painting in a nutshell is deceptively complicated. Uh, and that's really one of the great innovations, contributions that they have given to um, especially modern art, modern Western art, all the way back to you know the mid 1800s when there was um, the kind of the first trade was happening. Um, I mean, there was trade before that, but really the global trade was was really becoming a big thing and and 
Western artists started seeing um, prints by some of the, the great masters um, coming from China and Japan, and it sent shockwaves across um, uh, Europe, right? I mean, you would not have Van Gogh or Van Gogh. You wouldn't have him if he hadn't seen many of the prints by Hokusai. Um, you wouldn't see, like, Matisse, like, this painting, some people go like, well, it's a very Matissean painting. But the irony is that Matisse was taking from Eastern culture, uh, Eastern, like, traditional Chinese and Japanese um, approaches to painting, incorporated it into the Western style. That revolutionized the Western style. And then it's kind of through lean that the... Um, that it's it like that that all of that that weird transformation it came back into Asia, right? So it's this funny thing where really Chinese Japanese art you could there. I mean, I'm not. This is not just me making stuff up on the spot. There's been hundreds and hundreds of books written about this, but that that. All of this, you know, that Western art was revolutionized by Eastern art, and then it comes back through this artist back through into China, um, in a in its kind of tr in this weird transform transformed phase, right? So they've never been, except if you go back maybe five hundred years, where they were much more separate um, uh, art you know, styles and forms. Um, but it, there's, there was this exchange back and forth. And so I just, it's again, that, that the tragedy and the irony that the, all of the things that Lean Feng Mian went through was that he was just bringing back Asian culture back to Asia. Uh, like he, like it was like the, the wave coming back around, or I don't know how else you would describe it. Like, and the, so the, all of the things that he was, he was being like ostracized for was just basically, you know, bringing back all the things from Europe that the Europeans loved about Asian art. Anyway, it's just, man, like, and we wouldn't have, like, you wouldn't have, any of the great Chinese artists that we know of today without him, um, without Li, Meng, uh, Li Feng Mian, um, you just, the, the, the millions of Chinese artists that have followed in his footsteps owe them, owe everything to him. And it's, and the fact that so little relatively of his work. I mean, there there's thousands of paintings of his out there. Very few of them you can find here in, in North America um, or even online. Uh, but considering there were periods of time in his life where he was making upwards of 90 paintings a day, <laughs> the guy was cranking stuff out. He was a machine. And so that if you're thinking about, like, can you imagine, that's like we're talking tens of thousands of, you know, hundreds, well, I, mean, I don't know, how, probably, let's let's say by the end of his life, he had produced, let's say, maybe twenty to 50,000 artworks, I guess. And the fact that maybe at, at the highest point, we have about a 1,000 that survive, including, you know, these quick paintings and drawings that he was grinding out day by day, is is a, is a tragedy. And the fact that very few of his paintings prior to 1950 are still around. It's just like... Anyway. Oh, man. So this is this is my own small way of trying to kind of uh, remind the world of this um, this great artist and his huge contribution to, to culture and uh, wherever you are, my friend, you, um, 
you have you are are not uh, uh, forgotten for sure. Your contributions to to art and to culture will live on infinitely, uh, as long as there is a world. The, the, <laughs> your the, the the mark that you left. Um, you know, the, the flame burns brightly. I don't know what other kinds of <laughs> metaphors I can use, but it's like, I just, it's, you know, sometimes you just think like some people are, are just given such a hard path in life to, to, uh, and he, he, despite everything, you know, created like such great artwork and inspired millions and millions of people. <sighs> anyway, it's it kind of there's a in a totally different way, but it reminds me a lot of Van Gogh in that sense. Obviously, totally different biographies, um, but really didn't 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 never knew while they were alive the the how they would re essentially revolutionize the world, right? Okay, so thank you everyone for joining me for another one of these episodes. Uh, today's was like a really fun one to paint for me personally. Um, it's kind of quite meaningful to me. Um, I think also just as a teacher myself, and this guy was one of the most important teachers, uh, at least in Chinese culture. Um, so, uh, yeah. If you'd like to, to contribute to the show in some small or large way, there's PayPal links down below. You can send me an email or e-transfer uh, uh, or uh, any other possible thing you can think of. I'm sure we can work it out. You, uh, people have sent me things to Emily Carr where I teach, but I probably won't go back on campus until September if we're even teaching there again in September. We'll see. So probably the best thing is... is the regular channels I've mentioned. Um, hit like and subscribe. There is um, 17 people watching and 13 likes right now. So there's four people who have been watching for two, four hours or however long we've been going who haven't hit the like button. Why don't you do that right now? Okay, everyone. We will see you guys uh, in a couple of days. And uh, we'll talk about all that right now or later on. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. I'm kind of hungry. Um, we'll see you soon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me once again. And enjoy the rest of your evening. And we will see you again.